amb una col·laboració entre Art Nodes i el Comissionat de Cultura Científica de Barcelona, amb Vladimir de Samir, amb el qual tenim diferents dies de col·laboració. Aquesta crec que és una de les que més se diuen, probablement, amb la mateixa naturalesa de la nostra universitat, que amb la mesura que ens és possible intentem dur a la pràctica aquesta reunificació de les cultures. No sé si és gaire afortunada la idea del Charles Nou de superar el divorci entre cultura humanística i cultura científica creant una tercera cultura. Probablement el que tots veiem darrere d'aquesta tercera cultura és la unitat de la cultura, igual com també la mateixa realitat de les coses és una, encara que sigui complexa i analitzada des de molt diverses perspectives. Aquesta és també una característica del conferenciant que avui obre aquest cicle, que serà presentat pel professor Pau Alzina d'aquí uns moments. Jo, a part d'agrair la vostra presència aquí i agrair-li a Roy Ascot que ens acompanyi, doncs passo la paraula a Vladimir de Samir, que també dirà unes paraules des del seu punt de vista. Moltes gràcies i moltes gràcies a la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya per aquesta oportunitat. Jo he de dir que suposo que no desvello cap secret, rector, que fa ja algun temps, això del temps passa molt volant i no saps exactament, no tenim consciència exactament, no sabria dir si són mesos o anys, però penso que són anys que al teu despatx vas dir, Vladimir, hem d'explorar col·laboracions entorn a l'art, les tecnologies, les ciències, etc. Aquí vosaltres ja heu començat, evidentment, creant l'Art Nodes, protagonitzat i liderat per la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya i en col·laboració amb altres, i oberta a les altres col·laboracions amb altres universitats. I avui encetem un nou espai de reflexió que volem donar-li una certa continuïtat, com a mínim, com a mínim, un acte com el d'avui al trimestre, com a mínim, però intentar també que no siguin només conferències de persones de les que tenim moltes coses a aprendre, com el Roy Ascot, sinó que també puguem explorar que surtin d'aquí dintre iniciatives pròpies de reflexió entorn a les arts, a les ciències, a la tecnologia, dintre d'aquest marc del que també s'està configurant a la pròpia ciutat i a la pròpia Catalunya, que és a poc a poc col·laborant totes les institucions per posar no només la tercera cultura, sinó l'única cultura en l'espai central, l'única cultura en l'espai central de debat, de discussió i de progrés també de la pròpia ciutat i de la societat, donat que suposo que estem d'acord en què estem entrant. No sé si la terminologia és correcta o no en una nova era de la societat del coneixement. És una mica pedant, possiblement, aquesta qualificació, però si és així és necessari que fem aquests espais de debat. En principi hem convingut que el baptejarem com l'espai Leonardo, crec que estem més o menys d'acord en que sigui així, és una primícia, una primícia, l'espai Leonardo que crec que s'embolitza molt bé i això també s'enquiveix en una iniciativa que es presentarà també aquesta setmana que és la creació d'una acadèmia de societat i ciència a la ciutat. Això és una herència rebuda del Fòrum Universal de les Cultures, que el congrés que es va celebrar a Barcelona de la Xarxa Mundial Public Communication of Science and Technology, es va encomanar la creació d'aquesta acadèmia que crei un corpus de pensament i de documentació entorn a la relació de la societat i la ciència, això ho anunciarem precisament la setmana que ve, i estem col·laborant totes les institucions, Generalitat, Ajuntament, des de l'Institut de Cultura de Barcelona, que jo represento, i evidentment la Fundació Catalana per la Recerca, i evidentment invitarem a totes les universitats a participar en la creació d'aquesta Acadèmia de Societat i Ciència, que queda molt clar del que tractarà. I aquest espai, Leonardo, d'alguna manera ja s'avança a aquesta reflexió que volem fer i anar creant una base sòlida, podríem dir, de pensament entorn a aquests temes. I res més, donar les gràcies per la col·laboració i, evidentment, donar les gràcies a en Roy Ascot perquè sigui el primer i cobre el camí d'aquest espai.
Bé, doncs jo presentaré breument en Roy Escot, perquè pels qui no el conegueu i perquè els qui el conegueu, el coneixeu, doncs potser una miqueta posar al dia la seva activitat. En tot cas, primer, moltes gràcies per ser aquí. En Roy Escot, ell és director del Planetary Collegium, que és un espai d'una xarxa de recerca al voltant d'art, ciència i tecnologia arreu del món. És professor de tecnoètica a la Universitat de Plymouth, Anglaterra, i professor adjunt del Departament de Design Media Arts a la Universitat de Califòrnia, Los Angeles. Ell va ser director fundador del CAIASTAR, que va ser el primer doctorat en art, ciència i tecnologia que va existir al món, i a partir del qual va evolucionar i es va generar aquest espai que es diu Planetary Collegium. Va ser vicepresident i degà de San Francisco Art Institute, professor de teoria de la comunicació de la University of Applied Arts en Viena, president de l'Ontario College of Art i actualment està a l'Art and Media Panel of the Arts and Humanities Research Board al Regne Unit. És un artista i un teòric que ha exposat a la Bienal de Venècia, Electra de París, Arts Electrònica, de Lins, l'UB2 de Holanda, la Trienal de Milà, la Bienal de Mercosul Brasil, etcètera, etcètera. La seva recerca centra en la relació entre art i les tecnologies de la consciència. I és membre, editor, fundador del Journal Tecnoètic Arts, que és un journal de recerca especulativa al voltant d'art, ciència i tecnologia, i participa alhora al Consell de la revista Leonardo Electronic Apps, el LEA, de Convergence Digital Creativity i el journal de China Chines Tom.com, ha actuat com a assessor de diferents centres de nous media, de media labs i festivals d'Anglaterra, Amèrica del Nord, Vell del Sud, Europa, Orient Mitjà, de l'Oresco, i a l'hora d'organitzar les conferències que es diuen Consciousness Refrain, que s'organitzen cada any, que són molt interessants, que van itinerant per diferents llocs, i a l'hora acaba de... Bé, l'any passat es va publicar un recull de les seves conferències arreu del món, que es diu Telematic Embrace, Dictionary Theories of Art, Technology and Consciousness, i bé, en tot cas, deixo la paraula a en Roy Ascot i esperem que gaudiu de la seva intervenció i moltes gràcies. So, Roy, do you want to... Well, rector, vice rector, dean, faculty, students, I guess. Thank you very much and thank you, Pau, particularly for arranging this meeting. It's a great honor to be here and to talk to you because this is foremost amongst innovative institutions, I know that, in Europe, and so um, it's a privilege for me to be able to address you. New developments in uh, art generate new discourse and call for new language. Such terms that we need to produce and invent have to account for the emergence of the new media practices. Such terms, for example, as I'm sorry for that. Technoethics, uh, which is to bring together ideas of technology and the mind and consciousness, the way in which technology amplifies or extends or distributes or connects mind. But not ever to forget ways in which other cultures, ancient cultures, um, of many often forgotten cultures or despised cultures, have used technology uh, interpreting the word technology in various ways to amplify consciousness. Never to forget the spiritual dimension of mind as well as the artificial uh, intelligence which is being generated with machines and technology. Never to forget the cosmic view as well as the immediate cultural view. Another term which I have coined which I think is useful now is that of moist media because we're seeing the coming together of dry, silicon dry, digital systems and wet biological systems into a new kind of consideration 
not just of forms, that, but of ways of evolving forms and shaping them. Um, this moist media has to take on board the possibilities of telematics, of nanotechnology, of biophysics, of cognitive science, of pharmacology, quantum physics, consciousness research. All these things enable us to en uh, enter this, this new world that comes about from the convergence of artificial intelligences and, and, and our understanding of wet living systems. And with it, there is a call for a collaboration between artists and designers and musicians, uh, musicians and writers in terms of art, but also in terms of science. The infrastructure then, <coughs> material, conceptual, and spiritual, needed to support this emergence calls for creative agency, architectural forms, and cultural organisms hitherto unknown and unprecedented. As artists, we can alert ourselves to the future just as we can redefine ourselves. But in this process of redefinition, dependent as that may be on telematics, that's to say planetary connectivity, on nanotechnology, that means bottom-up construction, or quantum computing, which means accelerated and expanded cognition, we may be wise to seek re-entry into the spiritual domain that has long been blocked by the excessive materialism and insistent reductionism of our time. If the mission of 20th century art was to make the invisible visible, 21st century artists will be concerned with finding ways to allow us to sense the invisible in the visible. The ratio of the senses may shift and new perceptual modes may be uncovered. The ability to work with these invisible forces and fields rather than to try simply to represent them and the wish to engage directly in their implementation rather than with their implication will become increasingly evident as biophysics develops greater sensitivity to the modulation of new realities arising from our direct participation in life processes and art acquires new means of construction. As with all forms of prediction, art is suspended between the arc of desire and the pit of fear, promoting optimists and pessimists, enthusiastic visionaries, and those for whom technology represents the gravest threats to our humanity. Trajectories into the future rarely hit the target, the outcome in any case being that the arrow is seen as either half in or half out. I am constitutionally inclined to see it half in, making me a somewhat outlawed optimist, while many take a view that is more dystopian. During an Ars Electronica conference in 2002, Paul Virilio, who I think will be known to many of you, stated the following, and I quote, after 9-11, there are no more pessimists or optimists, but simply realists and liars. To which my response is yes, liars certainly, but to which reality do the realists subscribe? Is it a given reality or an emergent reality? And if it's given, who gave it, God or the state? Which was effectively the same thing in the West for many centuries. And it's a tradition that President Bush has revived with his own fundamentalist Christian business partners. A voice from the conference audience to which Virilio did not respond made the assertion that today is the day of the spiritual man and that we are in a race between the destruction and survival of spirituality and that the computer can help us to resolve planetary problems. It's within this context that we can understand reality, in my view, as an emergent phenomenon. That is the core issue in my mind. If we do not develop a planetary uh, consciousness over the next 50 years, uh, we are lost. Um, uh, however, planetary consciousness has to be built bottom up. There is no top-down blueprint. I'm looking forward to the slide. One thing... <coughs> As artists that we have learned over the past 30 years, not least from Heinz, uh, Werner Heisenberg, Marcel Duchamp, 
Heinz von Forster and Francesco Varela. And for those of you not familiar with these uh, thinkers, I would say that I'm sure familiar to many of you, but let me just rehearse briefly. Heisenberg brought to, um, to our attention ideas of quantum physics in a language that we could understand that put the measurer of reality, the viewer of reality, in the position of creating the state that was observed, either by the measuring instrument or by the intervention of some uh, process of examination. Marcel Duchamp would be known to the artists here as one who brought idea into art and found new formulations to enable that to be understood by the viewer. Heinz von Forster in 1976, I think, transformed our understanding of cybernetics, which after all was perhaps one of the most important intellectual events in 20th century thinking, the science of uh, communication and control in animal and machine, as Norbert Zwingli defined it. Heinz von Forster came along and said, yes, of course we must see the world in terms of all these interacting systems, and we have to understand that we're a part of those systems that the observer is not apart from the reality, the uh, observer is creating the reality. And Francesco Varela, with his idea of structural coupling, showed how the organism is its own self-controlling uh, system, but which is always structurally coupled with its environment. So these ideas um, are ideas which um, uh, we've embodied in some ways in our techno art. It's ideas that interest techno artists, um, and this idea that reality is constructed and we build worlds each in our different ways. We mirror that understanding in our virtual realities and bring both ambiguity and sophistication to the idea with mixed reality technology where consensual realities mingle subtly fusing the habitual and the virtual. Now, the power of metaphor, both in art and in science is hugely persuasive. Think how many of us, those of us who are artists, have absorbed the apparent contradictions and counterintuitive paradoxes of quantum physics without having the faintest idea of how the theories work or even the remotest command of the numeracy needed to evaluate the proofs and yet still find value in those metaphors and still use them as instruments of thought in the production of our art. It's not that scientists are immune to the persuasion of metaphor either. As Mara Bella has shown in her book, Quantum Dialogues, The Making of a Revolution, where she shows how the war of interpretation in quantum physics, which was under considerable dispute from at least five positions, how that war was won with metaphor, not with mathematics, by Niels Bohr, and his Copenhagen school. Similarly, the data-driven visualizations of the cosmos or of our own microscopic texture are coded conventions at best and ideological instruments at worst. Donna Cox of the US National Center for Supercuting, Supercomputing Applications in Ohio, who is the doyen of astrophysical visualization and who is, by the way, currently completing a doctorate in our planetary collegium shows how pernicious these visiphors, a term she reserves for data-driven visualizations, are in confusing metaphor with real reality in public understanding. Still and all, we have the question as to what real reality might be. As the astrophysicist Roger Molina, known, I think, to this university, said recently at Ars Electronica, in the science of cosmology, Confusion reigns. Scientists do not know what makes up 99% of the universe. Although recently there have been notable advances in our understanding of star formation and galactic structure, there seems to be another component of the universe, possibly making up most of its mass, which we cannot see and which we do not understand. This is the dark matter and dark energy quite other than the baryonic uh, matter of protons, neuro neutrons, and electrons that we can detect. Similarly, in genetics, our current horizon of knowledge uh, is low. About 97% of the human genome has been designated as junk since we have no idea of its function. 
in many cases were dependent on metaphor as much as data to explain the world. And in any case, we are in a sorry state if we confuse metaphor with reality and data with truth. Now, these issues will no doubt be prioritized in the future art science discourse. There is another element which has hardly surfaced in the last 25 years and which will provide the stem along which art science ideas will sprout and maybe blossom. That is the issue of consciousness, the nature of mind. This will bring to the table guests whom science will view with the utmost hostility fearing that their carefully constructed castle, from which society has been more or less ordered since the 18th century, may be shown to be a house of cards. These despised ones are those knocking on the door of materialism and strict causality, defying determinism and wrecking the reductionist ethos. They are looking for a more subjective science with a first-person perspective. The reductionist Objectivists will hold the garrison for quite a while until their myth of neutral science is exploded. Many outlawed epistemologies are now resurfacing. Field theories of various complexions on either side of the psychic divide. New organicism, contesting views of what constitutes biophysics and models of spirituality freed from the shackles of religion. Before addressing more directly the issues of art science conversion, I think it's important to consider the institutional frame within which new media art might emerge. This brings me to the issue of the academy, museum, laboratory, nexus that has hardly been addressed at any serious level of description. Most artists get their ideas initially about what art is or could be from the art academy. School has always been an arm of government. Public education was first instituted in the, in the UK in response to industrialization to produce workers with numeracy and literacy skills that would enable them to work machines, tend accounts, and keep time. Education was then seen as training. In the United Kingdom Education Act of 1944, uh, it was sought to replace training with education. Innovation at that stage was desperately needed to reconstruct society after the ravages of World War. Art schools were liberalized, leading to the golden years of the 1960s, which brought forward those tendencies that had been lurking at the margins of European culture since Cezanne's shifting viewpoint had altered the trajectory of art. Hence kinetic art, mixed media, performance, conceptual art. Art schools became the base for social action and social criticism and where the nature of individual identity could be questioned. However, while along with the advent of conceptual art, the ground was being prepared for interactivity in art practice. But the art academy made an about turn back to the idea of training, this time to create technologically informed consumers. Things now are at a pretty low ebb. Art education will have to transform itself or die. There is a curiously persistent view that creativity divides up neatly into pure and applied practice, fine art and design, and a convenient division of modes, plastic arts, music, theater, and so forth. It's becoming seen as a largely bankrupt model. But if not these divisions, then what kind of educational and creative structure um, could we hope to see? Certainly the larger domains of information, structure, and concept will define the learning landscape overall, while in each domain issues will arise within the context of speculation, theory, analysis, and social application. Teaching and research within the matrix that integrates questions of society, the self, materiality, and consciousness, we could expect to find programs at the intersection of five objectives. To amplify thought, which is concerned with concept development. To share consciousness, 
which is consumed with collaborative processes, to seed structures, uh, which is consumed with self-organizations, organizing systems, to make metaphors, which is consumed with knowledge navigation, and to construct identities, which is concerned with self-creation. There is little doubt, in my view, that the academy generally is in need of overhaul. Now, Power said this might be a point at which I would talk a little bit about some of the um, situations I've been involved in over the years, trying to de deal with these sorts of questions. This particular formulation came out of a project in Korea to build a new media art center, which would be both provide education and exhibition. It would sort of become a laboratory, a museum. Um, I was involved in the design of the, what's known as the Museum of the Future, which is the Ars Electronica Center in Linz, uh, way back in the early 90s. And uh, this rather crude little diagram, I don't know if you it's readable up there, was, was one attempt that, that I put forward to our group, and we just had six of us working on the design of this thing, to talk about the sort of layers of practice or objectives that would exist across five stories um, of, the, uh, of the building. Um, you can see the building wanted to bring what was inside, outside, and outside, and inside. And there's a sort of moral tale there, because one of the levels that we planned, the second level of this, what was to be a five-story building, was to be a business center. And the idea was, that we would have revenue, this is back in 1990s, we would have revenue from businesses that wanted to make satellite links or wanted to make computer links, and they would come there, just as in the old days, people would go to like a fax center to have faxes. But of course, over the three years in which the, the, of the gestation period of this design and its building and realization, the desktop of the business changed completely. There was absolutely no need for a business center, absolutely no need for that whatsoever. So, I mean, I think there's a moral <laughs> tale there that we have to be anticipating the future by five or ten years, even when we come to be building organisms. Um, this, is, this is to talk a little bit about the Planetary Collegium, how that arose. Um, there is a hub, which is where uh, the initial form of the process of the research has been developed. And we just opened a node in Zurich, uh, in the Hochschule for Gestaltung und Kunst. And the reason we've done that is that the way that this particular research institute works depends very much on a closely knit community where ideas are shared, and I'll explain that. And there's a limit to the size. So instead of building outwards within the university, we decided to create nodes, nodes of smaller groups of about 20 researchers, which is what we're doing in Zurich. Um, the week after next, I go to Beijing to talk about developing such a node there, and in the spring, for example, to Savannah College of the Arts in the United States to do that. So um, this was founded some 10 years ago, it came out of the need to uh, theorize the emergent field, as it was then, of interactive art. The art historians couldn't do it. There were no theorists. There were no critics. The artists themselves had to theorize their practice. And my view was that in order to generate even curricula for the undergraduate or master's level, you, what you can't in that way start bottom up. You have to go to the top. You have to have the finest exemplars of the practice, theorizing their work and allowing those ideas to cascade down and then to be formulated as a program. Um, so that's what we did. I won't go into great detail, but basically uh, uh, we, we started out in the University of Wales and then I was invited to develop the same thing in the University of Plymouth we made that one whole research platform, and then more recently I decided to, to bring it all into the University of Plymouth and to rebrand, <laughs> as they say, as the Planetary Collegium, uh, rather than the class star for obvious reasons. So it's a worldwide research uh, uh, community, and uh, these are the reasons I've given for us sort of developing the need uh, for it. We wanted to develop a transdisciplinary discourse we wanted to advance the integration of art and science, technology and consciousness. We wanted to facilitate worldwide collaboration um, and to achieve academic recognition. This was also important 
of a high-level research in interactive arts practices. How real is that? Well, consider this. There is not one dean of a faculty of art and design or of the arts in the whole of the United States who comes from art practice. The deans will come from musicology, possibly from architecture. They may be um, invited in from literature, but they will not be coming from art practice because in the United States, for example, the MFA, the master's degree, is seen as the terminal degree. But in the universities, an MFA is not sufficient degree to become a dean. So they're caught in a double bind. That they, can't be, they can't acquire the PhD, so they can't become deans, so you can't have the influence of the plastic arts in those fields. So there's intense interest in how that might be achieved, and of course you could recognize readily that our program, which does provide a PhD for practice, um, has been of great interest to, certainly in, in that country, but other as well. So basically the way this works um, is to be online throughout the year, to demand that um, uh, 30 hours a week, I mean, how we'll measure that, but a considerable time, a significant part of the week, is given over to research. The researcher has to show, the PhD candidate has to show that they indeed do have that time available within their duties. We meet three times a year for 10 days each time. The community of 20 researchers, and, and that includes three supervisors. And in that time, everyone presents a research update of an hour, which is then critically um, reviewed, so to speak, uh, by each person. So each member of the group makes critical observations on everyone else written, which are then synthesized, and a mentor for each student, each candidate, then synthesizes these observations and questions and puts them to each candidate, who in turn has to respond with a formal paper. I'm not sure if I've made that clear, but it's a way of sort of self-criticism on the one hand. Uh, of course, the supervisors are involved as well, but it's also a way of learning in quite a profound sense the issues and problems and processes of you know, 16 other researchers. So there's a considerable learning potential within that, I think. And it so happens that over the years we've been invited to have these 10-day sessions in different parts of the world. Um, what we usually do is, as, as is well known here, and we were extremely honored that, that uh, your university rector in, in invited us to do this, um, to provide three years ago um, a two-day symposium uh, where we addressed many of these questions, and we were hosted by the university. And this has happened um, uh, all over the world, um, which has meant that these are some of the institutions that we have um, uh, visited, um, you can see that we have then access to many, many, many cultures. And of course, at each place that we go, we interact very much with artists and scholars and scientists in those areas. We usually have one day where there's a special visit to a laboratory or some resource, a museum or something that is, potential, is just, uh, significant to that area that we're in. So, you know, um, that's, uh, so that's some of the places that gone. So over, over that period we graduated, and I'm just going to show you briefly, I mean, it's not a lecture about the Collegium, but I think it is significant. Um, some of the uh, theses which have been produced, um, I think 13 in all, have come out of the program. These artists, by the way, are, in, it happens to be many, in many ways, almost generic in their contribution uh, to the field, and that was the strategy, uh, that we start with as far as possible even generic practices. Um, and, then, and, and then work from there. Um, some of these artists will be known, I expect, to, to some of you who in the audience are concerned with interactive art in some way. And currently we have, these are some, I'm just briefly, but just so that you can see where they're coming from, the different countries, um, the sort of positions they occupy, uh, that's to say the relationship they will then have to carry through ideas into their institutions. Uh, there's some more of them and so on and so forth. So they're coming from various countries and, and whatnot. And then we have various, we have postdoctoral research, as you would expect, where people come from a year, for a year, actually either come to Plymouth in the lab there or come for those th three 10-day sessions in a given year and participate fully 
uh, in that uh, review process. Um, we also have a UNESCO um, uh, Ashberg pro uh, laureate for South America, and we have a particular interest in South America uh, as it's developing with, with, uh, with uh, new technology. And um, so we have people for three, three months at the expense of UNESCO who similarly take part in these processes. And uh, every year since 97, um, I've convened a conference on art and technology and consciousness. Um, this year, it's in Beijing. That was the call for papers, just to remind me to tell you about it, really, doesn't tell you too much about that. Um, there we have, and that's quite usual, 70 or 80 presenters from all over the world looking at these sorts of issues. Um, now, um, we're talking about art and science, and the node that I referred to in Zurich um, has, as the director of studies reporting directly to me in Plymouth, uh, Jill Scott, who is actually a graduate of the program, uh, Dr. Jill Scott, who um, has now five research students in the node, another three will join later. But interestingly, I think, uh, to our discussion, um, she has set up this uh, Artists in Labs program in Zurich, which has been extremely successful, uh, where she has canvassed, I can't remember how many, I think it's probably a dozen um, laboratories of quite different uh, distinction. I've, I've made a list, I think, there of some of the dropping this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, quite a, 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 a quite a range of uh, um, yes, uh, the first paragraph of, of, of laboratories where, where, where both they have offered some funding, they've offered some accommodation, and student or students, I mean artists who apply um, can have a residency there for three or six months. Now that's been very rewarding. They had a um, uh, they had a conference recently, and I think that will go forward. You may, uh, students uh, who, uh, and artists, uh, faculty members who may be so interested should uh, perhaps check, check that out because that's an ongoing program, collaboration with, with scientists. And those labs are of, of some considerable significance. Uh, we had a couple of publications, um, papers dealing with these, uh, with, with, with the proceedings. Um, and there's another one coming out soon. Um, there on the left is just to remind you that, that I, I had a, a, a thing called technoetic arts, which is looking at research in, which is somewhat speculative. It doesn't actually have to have all the finalized um, qualities that some research has demanded to publish it. In other words, it's research on the edge. It's speculative. It's feeling its way. It's not irresponsible but it's looking at somewhat dangerous areas, and it's looking uh, dangerous in the sense, academically, I mean, uh, and it's looking at a more transdisciplinary sort of discourse. And on the right, I had to plug my own book. I can't use that opportunity. Um, this is a plan. Oops, this is a plan for, um, uh, for a node. Uh, oh, dear, I'm losing everything. Sorry. There's a, I'll get this. This is a, a plan for um, a node which um, one of the graduates of the program um, has designed. And uh, oops, sorry. there's a way to get this moving. Yeah, that just gives you a sort of view. And the reason I show it is that I believe that architecturally as well, we have to think of new forms uh, to contain these new structures. Um, now, this doesn't apply so much to your university, of course, because it's a virtual university, and you are building virtual architectures. But some universities still are not quite that advanced, as you know, <laughs> indeed the vast majority of them. And they insist on cramming what they would want to have as new behaviors, new intellectual behaviors, into old buildings. They insist on that process, and we feel that we must think bottom-up about what might constitute an architecture. This, for example, is a sort of model of six nodes around the world interacting through a system of um, technological communications that uh, a kind of cybrid system, which has been designed by Peter Anders. And uh, the idea would be that it would work something like this, that you would, so to speak, dial up the relationship with a uh, with a virtual, this is very familiar to this audience, I know, excuse me, but this idea that you would bring together two places. Physically, you would see the other, you would see your partners, even though they're on the other side of the world, 
much more realistically, but through a screen, through a mirrored process, which gives the impression of a continuous space and greater intimacy and so forth. Okay, let's, let's return to, to the issues. <laughs> of the convergence of bits, atoms, neurons, and genes that I was talking about that constitute what I would call the Big Bang at the heart of our new media universe, it's the bit that is the most, the computer bit, that is the most familiar to artists. Computational systems and digital media have dominated the techno art scene for at least 30 years. More recently, in the late 1990s, work with genes has produced some exemplary projects. Most notably, perhaps, the transgenic work of Eduardo Katch with his GFP bunny, Alba. And uh, you see there a sort of up, up at the top there. Does it, does it make a point of that? Yeah. Um, you see his proposal for... Um, uh, for um, a, a, a dog, a green dog that would emit this low energy light, and which actually has been has produced the GFP bunny. Um, you probably saw that it made lots of newspaper headlines. Um, but of course, he didn't produce the bunny. The bunny was one of 23 bunnies in a laboratory just outside of Paris, and he selected one in the way that Duchamp selected a, a wine rack and a urinal uh, out of a hardware store. Um, but uh, Eduardo has a, a, another objective here, which is to talk about how one might, in this case, domesticate, or how one might bring into the human community transgenic living creatures as they emerge, which we can be quite sure they will. So I think there's, a, there's quite an, a, another very serious, apart from what was a three years ago, very shocking proposal um, that, that this uh, sort of luminescent rabbit would, would appear. Uh, it's to do with, it, the question is how, how they relate to our society. And then apart from genes there of course are neurons and neural networks and, and robotics. Um, there's been an art bots exhibition led by Douglas Repetto in New York over the past three years for example and there are a wide range of challenging possibilities in this domain work with brain signals of cultured rat cells controlling robots on the other side of the planet has distinguished the collaborative work between Steve Potter's lab at the Georgia Tech and Guy Ben Ari's lab at the University of Western Australia. I'll just look at a few references here. I mean this came up on the Discovery Channel quite recently, just a couple of days ago, um, with uh, Thomas DeMarche um, working with the living network of 25,000 rat brain cells connected to an array of 60 electrodes that can interact with a computer um, to, to fly a simulation program. Uh, so artists also, as well as the scientists and technology, are interested in this. Um, and this was, uh, th this was a product of that, that experiment with that arm drawing uh, images in Perth in Australia, which have been transmitted, actually downloaded as data uh, from the activity of those brain cells. This is the lab um, in the use of, which is interesting. Here the artist's studio migrates to a biology lab. And here we have Oren Katz and Ayanet Zur, who have been you know, pioneers in the field of working with living tissue, usually living tissue built on a glass substrate. Uh, and it can be argued that work in laboratories of one kind or another will increasingly replace work in studios, many eventually being located in truly remote regions such as the deep ocean or outer space. So one could imagine a virtual um, art department or art academy with a distributed studio which has, which has someone working in the deep ocean, has someone working in space, interacting uh, within a, a virtual space. <coughs> But this is just a brief introduction, and this is, a, this is one of our supervisors in our program, Steve Grand, uh, who's been working with um, um, neural networks to try to develop not, not a computer brain, but um, a, a learning network where this robotic creature will learn by training, uh, will learn even to speak by training. And uh, he's actually also acting as supervisor for us. Um, of the 
moist media components, bits, atoms, neurons, and genes. It's issues around the atom that I would like to concentrate on uh, right now, this evening. Why? Because that is the one area which is not really being looked at so much by artists. Genes, yes, lots of now. I was in a conference in Montreal a couple of weeks ago, lots of discussion, maybe 23, 25 artists working uh, with genetic material, with, with uh, organic material. Uh, neurons, yes, lots of artists working with robots, and the bit, hundreds and thousands of artists working with computers. But with the atom, at the, um, it's another, this is the nano level of perception, the molecular domain, and more particularly I'm interested in the organisms, the human organisms particularly, but all organisms, information network of photons, biophotons, light emissions that DNA molecules emit, and to look at the technological parallel with that that we would find in telematic networks spread across the, um, oh, I've lost a, no, yeah, sorry, uh, across the body of the planet. As science digs deeper into matter, moving, reassembling, and coordinating atoms and molecules in the nano field, the distinction between the organic and the technological will become less distinct. Similarly, our molecular knowledge may lead us to a better understanding of changes in consciousness and perception afforded by pharmacology. Now, if I'm right, I just wanted to show you that slide. I will come back to this question of pharmacology, but there's a technology there, and I think it's going to be important in various ways uh, in the future. Whatever is the case, we are now increasingly focusing our attention on the very small, at a level far beyond miniaturization. A nanometer, after all, is one billionth of a meter. This is at a level of perception that is in any retinal sense, and however technologically augmented, literally out of sight, so much so that the scanning tunneling microscope calls for touch rather than vision to navigate the nanofield and to manipulate individual atoms. Individual atoms have to be manipulated by a force feedback process which allows you to feel their uh, disposition in space rather than visualization according to the nanotechnologies. And this nanofield mediates between pure matter and pure consciousness in that it stands between the material density of our everyday world and the numinous spaces of subatomic immateriality. Now, there are a number of ways to view the nano phenomenon. And the popular view is that advanced by Arthur Drexler, who has provided a mechanistic and materialist understanding of its potential. His challenging ideas of nano engineering and material science promise self-replicating nanobots, self-renewing structures, and self-assembling environments, working within the body and within its environment and in outer space. Now, while molecular robotics, positional assembly, and self-organization suggest exciting possibilities for building new materials, manufacturing nano machines, and generally creating the fundamental blocks of nature into whatever configuration we desire, completely new materials to build with and new forms, there is a danger that the outcomes, even when beneficial in engineering and medical and social terms, could be spiritually hollow, and as such would exacerbate rather than relieve the excessive materialism of our time. In medicine, for example, there is the hope that artificial entities could identify or anticipate breakdowns in living systems and provide aid to failing organisms. However, some find that this view violates our understanding of the body as constituting a holistic mind-body field. So maybe not enough to put nano-sized, and it's not like that, it's <laughs> infinitely nano-sized robotic systems, uh, um, elements into our bodies to clear up blood clots and things like that. That may not be enough because we have to understand 
the body is not a collection of things. It's a field. It's very much more complex. But when the body is seen as no more than a material collection of atoms, well, then it may make sense to apply this materialistic strategy. But the living organism is infinitely more complex. And developments now in biophysics support this view. This view, atoms and molecules cannot be context independent. Another way of understanding the significance of our penetration of the nano world is to, to view these developments from the point of view of consciousness. And I think we'll just go back to that work. This could lead to what could be called a technoetic ontology, since nano, as I said, is the plane on which technology and consciousness can meet. Now, this challenge presents to the artist something which cannot be met simply by reiterating the common mantra that we hear nowadays of art science, art science, art science. Since the rhetorical reach for some kind of simplistic interdisciplinary marriage of art and science will probably not provide an answer. Just as it seems doubtful that the dialectical approach to technology and culture would be sufficient to begin to map the possible territories of consciousness that the nanofield might open up, particularly when our culture is so materially invested in products, objects, surfaces, and structure. Western art celebrates materialism even when it employs telematic diffusion or an ephemeral immaterial conceptualism. The faux postmodernist canon insists that process must always lead to product. And it's said to be due to the exigencies of the market, but equally I think it is evidence of the innate conservatism of some artists and some museums. And digital art, for all its inherent immateriality, has played into this materialist scenario. And the intense attention applied to the body during the last decade of 20th century art has also contributed to the situation. But materialists may, while materialists may see working in the nano field as the end game, it's not necessary to embrace a transcendentalism to see that nano is located between this material density of the everyday world and these numinous spaces of some Adobe immateriality. Um, so this um, process of, of, of working with the nano at the nano level, uh, brings us to a, another kind of level of perception, one that is both touchable and touchable, immediate and remote. And Chimzuski and Vesga, who I just quoted, um, have produced, for example, in, for those of you who are artists, um, a, a work at the LACME in Los Angeles, where um, sort of nano structures, blown up of course, for the one to uh, inhabit in a Lilliputian sort of way, can be moved around with one shadow. So there's a, there's a software which allows the shadow that you project on the wall actually to shift virtual objects which are also projected on the wall. So to give the feeling to the viewer of being immersed in, in a nano world and where touch is so important. Now on the other hand, you see there Krista Samara and Laura Minio's work, which is completely uh, nothing. It's a table, there's nothing on the table. Um, but in passing one's hand over with these magnets over the one can feel the disposition of nanoparticles in a way that the nano scientist uh, does. Um, the auditory sense can also be involved. Jim Juski has discovered, and he's publishing it in Nature, uh, that to touch um, on the atomic plane is to hear the voice of molecules whose sounds may uh, signal distress as much as harmony. The atomic force microscope allows him to hear the scream of a yeast cell as it is doused in alcohol. The individual atom, rather than simply employed as a building block towards denser material construction, can then be considered as a point of access to this complexity of immaterial domains. And there we have some students that in the seminar that I'm involved with at UCLA, um, and Niemitz and Andrew Pelling, who are, as we're orchestrating the sound of these molecules to make an artwork, which we will actually uh, show in, 
in Beijing or present in Beijing. So in the context of the brain, the nanofield provides the transition point between quarks and elementary particles on the one hand and molecules and neurons and neural assemblies on the other. In the context of consciousness, located between our material frame and the subtle body, between organs and aura. And it's towards the aura and the function of biophotons in living processes that I'd now like to, uh, to look. Uh, and, and from the perspective of both biophysics and mysticism, I'd like to advance a consideration about how an understanding of biophotons might contribute to a new prospectus for telematic art. The reason I want to do this is that I'm on one level to be talking about these general generalities about art and science, the desirability of us coming together. And on the other hand, to say, well, yeah, but what in particular? Well, my what in particular uh, is this of the, of the biophoton, which um, I'm very curious about. I want to know more about, and I want to see how that information network of biophotons. I mean, to, to give you an example, um, a cancerous cell well below the level of initial um, recognition by the regular medical analysis uh, can signal that it is cancerous by its emission, the frequency or rate of the emission of these biophotons, which are generated from within the body. They are chemical generation. They're not from the photons from the sun. And so there is a massive increase in the rate of, of, uh, of emission, which can be read, but of course not read just by the physician, read by the body. So the proposition that we will look at is that the body is a communicating system. And since photons are quanta um, phenomena, then a living system must be in a state of quantum coherence. So this is what, this is what interests me. Um, now while photons, that simple particles of light, have been successfully teleported, it's only very recently there has been success with far larger and more complex particles in the transporting the physical properties of an atom such as its energy and spin. And this involves the entanglement of two atoms where a disturbance to one particle instantly affects the other. This is Bell's theorem, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, no matter how far away it is. Now, this speed of, I mean, uh, a friend of mine who's completely mad and a wonderful physicist, and those two things often go together, um, Jack Sarfati in San Francisco, has actually patented a device in advance of the situation. Um, at the moment, you, say, you talk about splitting a particle, and the spin of one will always be the same as the spin of the other part. It doesn't matter how far you move it away. If, you, if the spin changes, the spin changes instantly, faster than the speed of light, which is kind of interesting. So Sarfati says, if we, and this is a huge if, if we could control the spin, we would have a Morse code. We would have communication, mm -hmm. which would be faster than light. Whatever is the case, the speed of transfer will not only advance the development of the quantum computer, but has far-reaching implications for telematic communications. So in the context of a technoetic parallelism between information networks in the body and across the earth, it amplifies the concept of a mediated mind. So research in biophotonics and electromagnetic fields is of significance to the development of this moist media. It will no longer be seen as paradoxical that our scientifically driven thought will relate to models of consciousness and human identity based in the spiritual tradition of cultures previously dismissed as alien or marginal. And I'm going to be arguing there's a lot to be learned about the structure, the communication means, the technology, it's a plant technology, of other cultures, as we find now in Korea, uh, in Brazil, um, in Gabon, in, in, uh, in Africa, and so forth. And art, in my view, will increasingly take on a more psychoactive complexion. Um, and so it will be found very important to link to archaic models of consciousness. I'm going to return to this, of course. Now, the biophotons, term biophotons, was first used by Fritz Albert Popp in 1976 to describe the quanta phenomenon of this photonic emission that I just talked about. All living systems emit biophotons, both those absorbed initially from the sun and those emitted spontaneously from molecules. And so building on the ideas of Alexander Gurevich, who was publishing in the 30s, and who, by the way, whose theories were somewhat 
doused by the success of molecular biology. Um, he was the Russian biologist who introduced ideas of the morphogenetic field and mitogenetic radiation. Pop argues that every change in the biological or physiological state of the living system is reflected by a corresponding change, as I said, of biophoton emission. And this may be indicative, he argues, of an information channel within the living systems that may relate to the chemical reactivity in cells. So biophysics is a field-based science. It doesn't deal with objects and their relationships first. It deals with relationships first and then objects. And it does lead to some fairly way out thinking, such as um, contrary to MIT's model of consciousness, which is that the mind is an epiphenomenon of the body, of the material body, um, bi some branches of biophysics will argue that the body, the material body, is an epiphenomenon of the mind. And recently, this, these theories have been very popularly but very usefully reviewed by Jean McTaggart in a book called The Field. And just as some of you may know, 20 years ago, a very controversial book uh, presenting uh, a morphogenetic model of biological processes informed Richard Sheldrake's book, A New Science of Life. Now, so field thinking uh, equally um, informs healing practices of various complexions. And the discovery of spontaneous biophoton emission lends scientific support to some unconventional ideas about the body's self-regulation, such as various somatic therapies, homeopathy, and acupuncture. And you can read there um, some of the, those areas which tap into these ideas. Now, these ideas are not very far apart from those which have been put forward in support of, for example, abstract art in the 60s, that, and or color theories that say that it's the field of color, it's the mosaic field, that is, one becomes, one comes to absorb the light emitted from surfaces which can heal. So these things are not too far from practices. Now, I would think they will be seen to be embodied much more in art practice as we go forward. Um, so a useful, another useful definition of the biophoton has been given by Masaki Kobayashi in uh, Japan saying, as you read there, it's um, a spontaneous photon emission without any external photo excitation through chemical excitation of the internal biochemical processes. Now, wah, 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 all these biochemical terms and all this kind of stuff. Does that remind you of anything? It reminds me of 25 years ago when we started looking at computers and we had to start, and, and cybernetics, and we had to start talking about black boxes. And we, had to start talking about retroaction, we had to talk about this. We had to learn a language. You know, we had to learn a language, even if we didn't know how the things worked, in order to get the technicians to work with us, we had to learn a language. I believe we have another language to learn. I think it's based in biology and biophysics. Um, and, uh, and I think some of us are beginning to try to, to learn it. But certainly, this is part of that transdisciplinary field that we, I think, believe we need to address in terms of educational models. Okay, um, now all this um, uh, sort of uh, interactivity, so to speak, within the body of communication networks um, means that there is this sort of fundamental interconnectedness, a kind of connectivism uh, at work in the cosmos at large between all of us. And it, the, this raises some interesting, I think, important issues about connectivity in media art. Simply put, between what fields might interconnect this light? We're quite used to interconnectivity between images and, and structures and people and so on in interactive art. But what fields might be interacting? How might the internal information system of networked photons interface with the external information network of a planet? Um, now, you see, some of the terms that are employed in quantum physics and in, and, and in biophysics are very interesting if you think of the terms that we use in interactive art, such terms as coherence, long-range interaction, non-linearity, self-organization and self-regulation, communication networks, field models, interconnectedness, and the inclusion of consciousness. These are, these are terms that we use routinely in interactive art now. It's non-linear. 
It's self-organizing. It's self-generating. Uh, Long-range interactions. You know, someone here and someone there can be here all at the same time. And indeed, these attributes relate to what I would call um, the canon of interactive art. Um, that is, um, has a sort of five-fold path to its realization. First, you have to have connectivity between people, between people and machines, between machines and machines. You have to be immersed in the space, not holding it at a distance. You have to interact mentally, physically, um, even if it's the sense of your temperature rising and causing changes in the situation through sensors. And as a product of that process, transformation takes place of images, of structures, of meaning, of your own consciousness. And from this emerges the work of art. So the work of art is not a given. A system is what is given. It's set up by the artist. The context is provided. And out of the interaction emerges what is the work of art or the art experience. Um, some sort of examples of, of that. I'm taking here not new work. This is, but what I would see is generic work. This is the work of Shaw Davis, for example, is interesting in this context. It's known to you, I, I suppose. But just to remind you that here's a very interesting interface. It's not a little pointy finger. It's where, as you breathe in, you float up through this virtual world. As you exhale, you float down. As you move your head this way, you move in that direction. What's interesting about it is within a few minutes of taking on this apparatus, you, it, your body instinctively follows your will. So you think, I want to be up in that corner. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go like this. You, you move up. I think this is really a very interesting development. Um, this is work um, with a life, um, generative art, where there are, um, where you, you see that little diagram. As a viewer, you come to a big bowl of real water. Um, you, on a pad, you simply do a little squiggle on two axes, and a creature forms in the water and wriggles about. And it has laws. If it hits another one in a certain way, it could destroy or be destroyed. Or if it joins in another way, it could reproduce an offspring. And that offspring will have the genetic characteristics of the two forms that came together. So it's using science very intimately uh, to create actually a very, very beautiful experience uh, where you are intimately involved as the artist, as, as the viewer. This is one of my pieces which goes back a very long way. <laughs> before the internet, um, looking at how um, a nonlinear text story can be produced um, with artists situated in different parts of the world. Um, I mean, it's quite a common practice now, but it is one of the sort of processes which is absolutely central to net art and so forth. That is a collaboration to create um, a narrative which is not linear, which bifurcates, which moves here. And this is a, 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 I'm not going to show a lot of my work, but this is just one talking about the architecture where at Linz at the Ars Electronica Center, we have a permanent installation which I designed, which is an elevator, which as you walk into it, the floor shows you what's underneath the floor. And then as you rise up, so you rise up through the building, out of the building, up into space, and view it from a great height. And similarly, as you walk in at the top level, you move down through the space. And it, it brings that sort of outside, inside quality to your experience of the architecture. And, and this, finally, I think, is another, another sort of branch of, of mind art, where those little robotic devices up on the top there are powered by light, which is, which is coming down. The more light they get, the more they move about. You're hooked up with a headpiece measuring the rhythms of the brain and so forth um, to the control of the light. And if you're really, really, really calm, Lots of light will pour down on the, on the robots. And then they start whizzing about. Because they start whizzing about, your mind becomes agi agi agitated. So the light source di you know, diminishes, and they stop moving about, at which point you have to get really calm again for them to start moving around. So there's a, that's another level of interaction, which is not just pressing buttons and so on, which I think is very creative and, and rather interesting. So very, very briefly, I'm not going to give a lecture on this, but I mean, just to talk about this cultural shift which is taking place um, as we, we move away from the plastic arts into these domains of, of uh, computational systems and biology. 
So on the left, you see uh, what, what was the case. I mean, it still is for those people working in that way. But the, the artist was seen as a content provider. The artist provided ideas, images, forms, experiences. Now the artist provides the context in which the viewer or the user can generate these things. Not too far away from some teaching processes where the teacher becomes less someone who is a channel of the information, rather one who provides the context in which the information can be generated or acquired. And instead of being concerned with objects, more concerned with process, rather than perspective which places the viewer at a distance from the work um, to invite the and viewer into a virtual space or a virtual university for that matter. Instead of that paranoia which was at work with the old culture, smokestack, industrialized culture of excessive privacy, anxiety and so forth, it seems to me that the networks as they open up offer the possibility of a kind of telenoia, of a kind of enjoyment of telematic uh, relationship. And, and so on. I, I can't go in great detail, but basically I'd bring you to the bottom of the list and talk about there is a shift from the way that narratives, images, musical presentations, sort of, had always to be resolved, always had to be composed, always had <coughs> to have an inner harmony to a situation where we were concerned with really with the behavior of forms, musical forms, plastic forms, visual forms. Now we're concerned with the emergence, open-ended sorts of structures, where the conclusion, if it's to be reached at all, is reached by the participation of the viewer or the listener. And so we're more interested in forms of behavior. And there's some, uh, oh, we're going to talk about mixed reality, sorry. So, well, I'll just leave you with that. Within the field of biophysics, a revision of older theories of living systems abandoned with the successful rise of a molecular biology, as I said, is now taking place. Um, let me move on this. Field thinking then is one of the central elements of this new biophysics as a means to synthesize the complexity of its details and as the means to model interconnectedness and non-locality. So this interconnectedness is hugely important in the aesthetic of art as it develops. And bioelectromagnetics will play a central part in this new biophysics. And the existence of non-electromagnetic fields uh, in and between organisms cannot be excluded. Heisenberg, who argued that there are two places in the human system where quantum indeterminacy of a single particle can have a, a profound influence, explored the relevance of quantum indeterminacy of elementary particles for biological systems, especially human systems, and the first important effect is that of mutation in the genetic code. The second is the alteration of behavior of neurons during human thought processes. So consci consciousness cannot be excluded anymore from biophysics. Remember, consciousness has always been left over there. And it's only in the last 20 or so years that consciousness research has actually arisen. And in that time, for example, the rather well-known uh, conference for, uh, towards the science of consciousness, which is held every two years in Tucson, has been taking place. I think there have been four or five iterations of that, four anyway, that I know about. Um, and there, you know, you have over 700 um, scientists, largely scientists, some artists coming together every two years to present. That's five days of about seven streams of lectures. And they're all hounding this question, what is consciousness? Where is mind? It's right at the top of the agenda and certainly is becoming part of the agenda of new media art. Um, so globalization at the planetary level and entanglement at the quantum level means not only that we're all connected, but that our ideas and our institutions, even our own identities, are constantly in flux. And consistent with this, moist media might bridge the artificial and natural domains to transform the relationship between consciousness and the material world. At the material level, Mixed reality technology provides us with another skin. These are rather inadequate examples. I couldn't find any on the web, to be honest, that would really illustrate. But I think you may all be familiar with what mixed reality technology is. It's that technology which allows one, for example, to be in this room here and now 
seeing all that we see, and at the same time see an agent or an animated figure dancing on this table who actually has been generated in Australia in real time and is being transmitted to us now. I mean, that's, it's the mixture. It's, it's what it says. But I'm thinking that this mixed reality technology provides us with another skin, another layer of energy to the body, adding to the complexity of the field which consists in which the body is uh, uh, manifest. So instead of populating mixed reality space with virtual objects, we would be more integrative if we considered it as a medium for the creation of fields, virtual fields if you like, as an extension of the biofield itself. Just as the relationships between biophotonics and psychic states is under examination, so too might virtual space be seen as the generated of, generator of altered consciousness. Just as DNA is the main source of biophoton activity, so might mixed reality be the field in which new possibilities for living systems might be rehearsed and from which a cyber morphology... But I mean, I think that even virtual reality technology, limited as it is, is nothing in itself. I think most digital work, most of the things that we can do with digital mechanical systems right now is rather a rehearsal for what we will have to do, we will have to think about doing with moist, with wet biological systems. You know, we're at still at the level of representation. We're soon going to be at the level of implementation. It started, I suppose, in some ways with that was it Fellini film, or The Red Desert, where the, pe the desert gets painted red. Now we're not talking about that representation. We're talking about the desert becoming red. Um, we know this. We know that new forms are being built. They will not be denied. I mean, stel stem cell research and so on will not be denied. As artists, it seems to me, that we are already in a position of rehearsing what these forms might be, how these new kinds of entities might interact what these new kinds of environments, architectures which grow bottom up, for example, in the way that crystals do, rather than being planned top down. There seems little doubt that this will emerge. Artists are in a very um, uh, privileged position to be able to play with ideas about that before this emerges. Um, so if the whole body is to be considered in a state of quantum co coherence with each molecule interacting with each other within a field, just as the field has a regulatory effect on molecules, so molecules give boundary limits to a field. Thus, we recognize an or a separate organism. But what happens when a mixed reality environment extends, the, extends this boundary and redefines the field? Mixed reality, networked reality, telematic virtuality would, I suggest, become entangled with the quantum states of coherence leading perhaps to the emergence of a kind of universal connectivity and non-linear relationships that exist beyond the classical constraints of space and time. The first, I'm going to skip this. I was going to talk about Froelich's, uh, who in 1968 introduced his first theory of the coherence of the organism. But I'll move straight away, I think, to this theory of immaterial connectedness that's put forward by Hans Peter Dürer because it's, as you might expect, particularly relevant to what I'm trying to argue here. Um, he asserts that the physical basis of life is an immaterial connectedness that he describes with five significant points. Quantum physics reveals that matter is not composed of matter, but reality is merely potentiality. I'd like you, as I rehearse these things, to remember what you know about what I've been talking about in terms of interactive digital new media art. The language can apply across the board in some ways. So it's not composed of matter, but reality is mere potentiality. The world has a holistic structure based on fundamental relations and not on material objects, admitting more open indeterministic developments. This, in this more flexible causal framework, inanimate inanimate and animate nature is not to be considered as fundamentally different, but as different order structures of the same immaterial entity. A stable configuration effectively, in a stable configuration, effectively all the uncertainties at the quantum level are statistically averaged out, thus exhibiting the unique and deterministic 
behavior of ordinary matter. He's trying to square the circle. He's trying to show that the quantum world and the Newtonian world need not be completely separate. How can it be that there can be interaction between these two worlds? And so in the case of statistically unstable but dynamically stable configurations, the lively features of the underlying quantum structure have a chance to surface to the macroscopic level and be connected with what we observe as a phenomenon of life. Now, it's within this context of connectedness that I foresee the insertion into art practice of a new technology, an additional technology, which is actually a very ancient technology, and it's that of the psychoactive plant. I think, a psy and this is some of the work that Schultes, who died just fairly recently um, at Harvard, was uh, developing over a period of 30 years, a study of the use of the psychoactive, psychoactive plant in the changing of consciousness in some um, groups in South America and elsewhere. A sort of cyber botany may arise around the psychoactive or entheogenic instrumentality of such plants as the shamanic liana, the ayahuasca, known as the vine of the soul, used in countless communities in Brazil and Colombia. I want you to see this as a technology, which is, of course, what it is. It's not our kind of technology, but it is a technology concerned as much with the transformation of consciousness, with change of perception, with change of worldview, as I believe uh, digital technologies, communication technologies have been or could be more used in so doing, changing perception and our understanding of the interconnected of the world. And it's, I would contend that pharmacological processes of what I will call vegetal reality and the computational systems of virtual reality will combine to create a new ontology, just as our notions of outer space and inner space will coalesce into another order of cosmography. I'd call it ontological engineering. And cyber botany covers a wide spectrum of activity and investigation into the properties and potential of artificial life forms within the cyber and nano ecologies, as well as the technoetic dimensions and psychoactivity induced by the psychoactive vegetal products of nature. Now this was first suggested to me in a way which is highly speculative by the writings of Jeremy Narby who speculates that the origin of shamanic visions may be found in the light emitted by DNA. And I do see some significance in the idea that biophoton light stored in the cells of the organism, actually in the DNA molecules of their nuclei, gives rise to this dynamic web of light which is constantly uh, released and absorbed. So the idea being that somehow the intervention of this technology, this pharmacology, these drugs to use our language but they're natural products, allow the shaman to access data in our terms, which is deeply, deeply embedded in the DNA. Just as we access through the computer interface the data which is deeply, deeply embedded in our data banks. And looking at these two things, not simply to compare one to the other, but say there's a possibility of some kind of merging of these processes. So I think there's much to be gained in both biological sciences and the arts for research that seeks correspondences and collaborations between uh, the technologies of machines and plants. And there I talk about the three VRs, just as a sort of convenience uh, to link them together. Virtual reality, which of course is an interactive digital technology, which is telematic and immersive, as I explained. Validated reality, which is your Newtonian reality, the one that makes the buses run on time um, and allows you to fall off the platform if you, if you walk in the wrong direction. It's very real, it's very present. Um, and vegetal reality, that is this psychoactive plant technology which is entheogenic and spiritual. Indeed, it could be argued that the whole ecological movement would gain if a constructive dialogue with technology would be instituted which tried to see the deep correspondences between Western science and archaic knowledge. The problem is not with science, but with the, with the rejection of science at its leading edge in favor of the old scientific paradigm, that very paradigm which refuses the spiritual implications of quantum physics, for example, or the very intelligence of plants, so to speak, that biophysics might reveal, or indeed the biophotonic matrix 
that may embrace all living systems of the planet. After all, if DNA is emitting information, so to speak, through its photons in one organism, it's the same DNA which is emitting information in other organisms. And there is no reason to suppose why the DNA from one might not be communicating to the DNA of another, again mating for Hans-Peter Dürer's um, uh, immaterial connectedness. So the um, space in which biophotonic and teleportation art might be constructed could be located in the um, triangulation then of connectivity, syncretism, and field theory. And what is at stake is that all integral systems should be coherent. Connectivity is at the root of cultural coherence. Syncretism is at the root of spiritual coherence, the kind of syncretism one finds currently, for example, in Brazil, where spiritism, candomblé, Catholicism, metaphysics of other kinds are integrated. They, re they retain their identity, but there is a syncretic whole in which there is respect for all the parts. Um, and then field theory is at the root of quantum coherence. Um, I mean, one can then talk about uh, the sort of processes which enable us to come to terms with these, these, three, um, these three areas of concern which I've identified, which are, of course, interaction, direct interaction, research, and the memory that needs to be at the base of all of this to research from. And then you put it together, and that seems to me to be the agenda, so to speak, for art over the next 10 or 20 years. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say a new science emerges with biophysics, biophotonic informatics, organicism, and the forming potential of fields and field theory. And so too could art develop, perhaps beyond the digital, virtual, and telematic domains, towards the realization of new possibilities of living and learning in this new biotechnological world, weaving our realities within the universal network of light. In this new understanding of the world and ourselves, what was once classically seen as coherent in the world, that made sense of the world, is now seen largely as illusion, rather as if we had acquired access to behind the scenes of Duchamp's Etat Donné in the Philadelphia Means. For those of you who are not familiar with his work, uh, you're presented in the Philadelphia with, with a big old door. And there's this little hole in the door. And you peek through the hole, and you see a remarkably realistic scene of a, you can't quite, you have to interpret it largely, but it's a, it seems to be a nude model of some indeterminate gender, but with a real waterfall and with real light and so on. And then if you were ever to walk around the back of that, so to speak, which you can't do, you'd see it's put together with bits and pieces and string and, and tape and, and so on. It's, it's a critique of the Newtonian uh, view of, of the world. So metaphorically, one could say that we're moving from the darkened chambers of early digital art into a biophotonic light, sorry for the poetry, providing a new field in which we can address Schrodinger's eternal question, what is life? And in so doing, we may as artists begin to provide a bridge between the biophotonic information network of our own bodies and the te telecommunication networks we're building in our technological world. So thank you very much for your attention. If you want, you can ask a question. To, uh, yeah. Um, uh, si hay alguna alguna pregunta, algo tengo alguna pregunta para el profesor Ascot, uh, algún comentario, alguna. ¿Sí? No. Está digerido. and hear your talk. You've been inspiring us and uh, shaking our minds, our imagination, and our inspiration. I think that's 
very useful in a context like the uh, walk. We are based on something that we don't know exactly what it is, that's virtuality. So all you say should be the basis of what of the, of the uh, culture of our university. It's fundamental. I believe that there is a fact in the Hi ha alguna altra pregunta? Algun altre comentari? Vinc tot uns dies. Vinc tot uns dies? Em sortiran les preguntes. Hem de digerir realment la gran quantitat d'idees suggerents que ens ha plantejat Boi Ascot, com deia fa un moment el rector. Us agraïm molt la vostra assistència. Us agrairem que ens ajudeu a construir tota aquesta nova xarxa de relacions que que poden enriquir tant el món del nostre entorn i esperem veure-us de nou Estem obert a propostes via Pau Estem obert a propostes Feu servir la connectivitat la consciència general i la creativitat Gràcies Gràcies